Welcome. I'm uh, Captain Wheeler from the Office of Emergency Services, and this is uh, Captain Don Nicholson, also from the Office of Emergency Services. And this is the third of a series of four workshops. This one will be focusing on uh, evacuation and the wildland urban interface. And if you have any questions, uh, please raise your hand. Uh, I think you'll all be muted. Um, but we will try our best to answer any questions you might have. We also have uh, Chief Garrett Contreras and Chief Eric Vollmer, uh, Deputy Chief Eric Vollmer, uh, along with us. And so uh, we're, we're really glad that you showed up. So today we're going to talk about <clears throat> a, a few things. I, I assume you can see our agenda on the screen. We'd like to talk a little bit about the different types of hazards with a focus on the uh, urban interface and also talk a little bit about my screen's blocked weather and how that will affect us and then the uh, different uh, alerting systems and talk a little bit about the levels of evacuation and talk about the evacuation zones and preparing for evacuation how to get ready get set and to go and then when to evacuate, and we'll talk a little bit about some of the drills and things that we have upcoming. Turn it over to uh, Don. You can advance the slide. Uh, um, that's you. Let me talk a little about this one. So let's talk a little about some of the potential hazards that we could have in the city of Hayward. Uh, there's natural hazards like fires or earthquakes or thunderstorms or um, floods. There's also man-made disasters um, like uh, a terrorism attack or uh, a hazmat spill um, that would cause a, a cloud that would be dangerous and we might have to evacuate. So we are in all hazards department. We're ready for everything. We try to be ready for everything and try to forecast what might happen and develop a plan for that. And so today we'll talk a little bit about um, how we would react to some of the more likely um, situations, especially this time of year. Okay, you can advance the slide. All right, so what our main focus is, is the wildland urban interface. So uh, maybe you've heard of that before. Um, if you're in this meeting, you probably live there. Um, we shorten it, we call it the, the WUI. So that stands for wildland urban interface. So what is the urban uh, wildland urban interface? Uh, what that is, is when we build houses close to natural environment that has fuels like uh, uh, wildland, you know, grasslands or uh, forests. So um, what that does is it poses a couple problems. Um, and what this video series is really focusing on is the accountability of, of everybody that lives in the, in the wildland urban interface uh, to, you know, take some responsibility and know when there's, you know, the alerts and stuff, the red flag warnings uh, that we're currently in right now. Um, and that's what this, this uh, workshop is going to focus on. Uh, so we're going to cover that in a later slide. So what is the wildland urban interface? Um, what kind of hazards does that um, pose on um, everyone is that, um, we have more fuel uh, fires that start because of human uh, ignition, and that we also have um, more valuable things that we have to protect. So, you know, human life and uh, that of you know your homes and your property and stuff. So, um, you can advance the slide. That's you, Paul. So, let's talk a little bit about what are some of the factors that would uh, affect a red flag. Maybe you've heard that term, red flag warning. And uh, what that means is there's conditions that are more likely to, to cause a fire to get out of control quickly. So one of them would be low RH or relative humidity or, or the, um, the moisture content in the, in the fuels. And we watch that very closely because that will affect how fast the fire spreads. Strong wind is another huge factor that would uh, affect a fire. It's not uncommon on a windy day for an area the size of a football field to light up within a minute. And so it's very important that we watch closely to catch these things as early as possible. 
Another thing would be dry fuels. So if we're in a drought, uh, if, if um, it's late in the season, then the fuels have a tendency to dry out, which will cause it to spread. Lightning's another factor, uh, especially up in the mountains. And it's very common every year to have thousands of lightning strikes. And sometimes uh, a storm will come through and there'll be lightning strikes all over. And these fires will, will eventually burn together if we, if we can't uh, get to them before they, they spread. So any combination of any of those would cause a red flag warning. And it's unusual that we're in a red flag warning. The season seems to be longer and longer. So it's, it's a little early from uh, traditionally, but uh, the red flag warning that we're in now is uh, just got extended through tomorrow afternoon. And so it's important that we, that we uh, think about that. The other factor or the other, the other element of that would be uh, public safety power shutdowns. And that of course has stemmed from some of the other fires where PG&E's equipment has caused a fire and uh, they want to reduce those hazards. They'll shut off the power in an area to reduce the potential for wind to hit wires together or something that would cause a fire in these extreme conditions. You can advance the slide. All right, now we'll talk about weather warnings and alerting systems. So here in Hayward, what we have in place is uh, we have a, a fire station on Hayward Boulevard. That's fire station number five. Uh, the duty captain on shift uh, monitors the weather uh, at least three times a day, uh, looking for uh, any you know severe weather conditions that could contribute to fire spread you know rapidly. So, um, a red flag warning, like Captain Wheeler just said, uh, is in effect until tomorrow at six p.m. Um, and we're gonna um, we're gonna explain later on uh, how to uh, be more aware of uh, when these conditions um, occur. So. Um, a red flag warning is issued when fire weather conditions work, uh, could worsen in the next 12 to 72 hours. Um, all fire stations in Hayward will, uh, and Fairview will fly red flags, um, as you see in the picture there that says uh, fire weather. So um, the other thing is fire crews are strategically pre-positioned. So what that means is if it's a vulnerable or a susceptible day to uh, cause, uh, to be a, a, a fire hazard, um, we'll we will pre-position apparatus to uh, be able to respond a lot quicker. And I think uh, the next slide will cover um, what pre-positioning is because we have a couple different um, uh, things to cover. So go ahead. So here's a picture of an actual pre-position. That's the type three type engine. That's an off-road fire engine that uh, is based in the Fairview fire station. So on a day where, where it uh, has a higher potential for uh, a fire, then we'll, we'll put fire apparatus like this and crews, in addition to the crews that we normally have on duty, and we'll put them in the most vulnerable areas. And uh, they'll watch closely for smoke, they'll monitor the weather, they'll monitor the wind, and um, they'll be able to get to a fire much quicker and be able to stop the fire before it gets out of control. So that's that's proven to be very successful. Okay, you can go back and slide. There we go. Okay, what to do when red flag warning is issued? Uh, there are certain things that you can do uh, to make sure that you are well prepared to uh, evacuate if need be. Uh, you know, um, if you're not prepared to do that. Um, if you don't have that in your mind at all, it's going to take a long time. Just think about how long it would take uh, for you to accumulate all the stuff that, that, you know, that you think is valuable because, it, you know, in people's lives, a lot of stuff is, is valuable. But what we have to uh, be concerned with is uh, life safety over everything. OK, so make sure you get out and you stay out and, um, you know, you don't have a tendency to go back to get something that you might have for, forgotten. So um, some things that we can do, you could park your vehicle uh, in the driveway facing out in you know, anticipation of evacuation. Um, Preload your vehicle with go bags, first aid kit, keepsake items, uh, um, water, um, uh, first aid kit. Oh, I'm sorry, I already said that. Um, things of that nature that are essential, that's gonna help you survive if you do have to evacuate, so. 
uh, plan to evacuate before mandatory order is issued. So if, if you um, got an evacuation warning, um, what this would do is, you know, say, um, get you prepared to evacuate when the order came. But if you have, um, you know, uh, if you have mobility issues or, or, uh, or you, you, you know, if you think about it, if you evacuate early, you're going to be avoiding the traffic and the conditions are probably going to be a lot better than, you know, waiting until an evacuation order is uh, in effect. So uh, the other thing is take only one vehicle per household to help reduce traffic. Um, this is one of those things where you're thinking about others, uh, you know, not to, to take all four of your vehicles, if you have four vehicles, um, to clog up the roadway, because uh, we're going to be showing you a video pretty soon of what it, you know, what it could look like in the event of an evacuation. Um, let's see. Uh, oh, another thing is uh, always keep your keys in your pocket when, you know, when the, the uh, conditions are, are right for uh, 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 an extreme fire so uh, that you never have to go throughout your house looking for them. So you always have them, you know, in your pocket. You can advance. This is neat. Yeah. So living in the um, wildland urban interface uh, comes with a lot of responsibilities. You're required to uh, watch a little closer. Uh, you, you need to pay attention a little bit more. And so uh, there's, there's several factors to watch. The weather, of course, is a big thing. And there are different warnings that we put out. We'll talk a little bit about the different levels of warning and um, the, the different systems that the county has for alerting people as soon as possible. So we do our best to uh, monitor all the social media outlets. And um, the Alameda County has something called AC Alert. And that's probably the most important thing you can do. You can sign on to AC Alert or opt in. And when there is something that is um, major and, and very important, you will get contacted automatically through this new system that, that's been built. Uh, it would be either a text message, a phone call, an email, uh, really whatever you prefer. And it will, it will go on to the different uh, methods of contacting you depending on um, if you answer that device or not. And so if it, if it doesn't, you don't pick up your phone, it'll send you a text. But we'll talk a little bit more about that because that's probably the most important thing you could do as far as awareness and finding out what's going on. Um, I want to talk on, on this a little bit because I think uh, the slide got advanced. Um, I think uh, you were supposed to talk about pre-positioning, but uh, um, <laughs> sorry. Um, the other thing that you know we want to be responsible. It, uh, for you know, knowing what the, the conditions are. So um, some of the things that you can do, I know some of you might not be on social media, some of you are, um, but uh, if you're on Twitter, that's a great source of, of information. So um, here, the Hayward Fire Department, we have our own Twitter account. Uh, it's called Hayward Fire News. So if you follow that, uh, we don't, um, um, you know, uh, and, and then if you follow that, as well as the uh, National Weather Service Bay Area, um, they send out red flag alerts um, uh, well in advance. You know, they they have all the technology to do that. That's that's what they what they do, and they get that information out through Twitter. So when there's something um, you know that's coming, um, I do the social media for uh, um, the fire department. So um, I'll put that on on Hayward Fire News on Twitter. So um, the goal is to let as many people as possible know about it. So if you are on Twitter, um, if you go to um, the user profile, um, the icon, uh, it should be on the left-hand side. If you click on that, and then you'll see a little bell with a plus sign, uh, that is for notifications. So if you click on that, you're basic, basically subscribing to the uh, Twitter feed. And when you do that, every time we post something, you get an, an, uh, a notification. So in doing that, that is showing responsibility for the upcoming, you know, extreme fire weather that we could be having. And, you know, it would, it would kind of start the ball rolling uh, for you to be prepared about that. Okay. So, um, 
The other thing is uh, weather.gov, that's the National Weather Service. Um, the other one is uh, if you're not on Twitter, but you're on Facebook on Hayward Fire News, uh, follow uh, that account. And um, I, I do it kind of uh, redundant. You know, I'll do it on, I'll post on Twitter and then I'll also post on Facebook. So I know uh, some people don't have all the social media, uh, they only have certain ones. Um, so, you know, I, I try to, um, or I do keep all that that up. So another thing is uh, local media, you know, uh, watching the news um, or, or your radio, listening to your radio. Uh, but the biggest thing is AC Alert, like Captain Wheeler was talking about. So, um, you know, you can sign up for AC Alert. And if you live in, in Hayward or Fairview, uh, but say you work in Pleasanton, uh, you can sign up for both locations. So if you're at work and something happens in Pleasanton, uh, you'll get notified. And the way they notify you is a redundant system there as well, is they text, email, and they call you, they call your landline, they call your cell phone, um, and it won't stop until you uh, confirm that you have received it. So, um, you know, right when you get the message, uh, there was just one that went out for a red flag warning for the current uh, situation that we have. Um, and, you know, when I got it, um, I put confirm, you know, put, uh, typed in Y for yes, and they stopped sending me information. So that's basically their clarification that you received the message. Okay, so the way to sign up for that, uh, you can go to our website, which is hayward-ca.gov uh, backslash um, ac-alert. Um, also, uh, you can go to um, acalert.org. Um, yeah, acalert.org. Um, and the parent company is called Everbridge. So if you, you know, if you type that in and you see Everbridge, uh, that's actually AC Alert. So, and like, like Captain Wheeler was saying, throughout Alameda County, that's what we, that's our mass notification system. And we're not going to send you messages saying there's a parade in town, come join us or something. It's for emergency purposes only, okay? You can advance the slide. Okay, so when fire is approaching, so, um, you know, I talked about evacuating early uh, at the warning. If there's a, a, an evacuation warning, say a fire's coming, it's, you know, a couple miles away and, uh, you know, uh, conditions on, on the fire ground can actually change really, really rapidly. So, you know, change in the, in the wind um, direction, um, you know, could cause that fire, to push that fire to uh, communities, neighborhoods, uh, you know, to where, you know, where your residence is. So um, being able to um, evacuate early, like I said, you know, the traffic's going to be lighter and the conditions are going to be a lot better usually than, than, you know, waiting until an evacuation order. Um, uh, let's see, if smoke is really heavy, um, like um, I know that um, we would get calls for a dispatch center when there's a fire like, you know, far away. And, you know, why is there so much smoke in, in the Hayward Hills? Uh, fire, uh, smoke travels, you know, pretty long distances. So uh, if you imagine a fire that's, you know, a lot closer, um, there's going to be a lot of smoke. So, you know, make sure you, you have the N95 masks. Uh, at your disposal and in your kits, which we'll, we will be talking about uh, pretty soon. Um, another way to prepare if a fire, you know, is, is coming to you, uh, to your house um, or in that direction, is to uh, turn off your propane tanks. Uh, you know, we, in our previous workshops, we talked about defensible space. And, you know, hopefully um, everyone saw that presentation that's on today and started doing a little bit of work to their house, uh, you know, actually a lot of work if need be and uh, prepare for you know, this wildland season. So um, remove any fuels near your house if you, you know, if the fire is approaching, if you have time. But like I said, evacuate early and avoid the traffic and, you know, anything that could be a catastrophic you know, event, you know, if the fire decided to, you know, make a run across the road or something like that. So um, if you, if you are in those kind of conditions, you want to wear, you know, long sleeves, um, preferably 100% cotton or wool, uh, not like, you know, Lycra, the, you know, the um, dry fit stuff, that kind of stuff that could actually melt. Um, and you don't want to, uh, 
um, to dispel a rumor. You don't want to wet yourself, uh, you know, with uh, water to uh, kind of absorb the heat because that could actually cause steam burns. So, um, the next slide. So <clears throat> the city of Hayward um, has gained a lot of experience over the past few years. Uh, I remember my first fire was the Oakland Hills fire. And uh, at the time they said, the, the other firefighters said, you'll, you'll never go to a fire this big again. This is a, a career fire. It, they'll never be this big again. And now I think the Oakland Hills fire is probably ranked number eight. We've had so many big fires and the city uh, through the mutual aid program has sent crews to I think every one of them. And um, the decision to evacuate for a fire or for some big incident is, is never taken lightly. Uh, all factors are considered and um, there's, it's usually a joint command with police and fire and the decision is made uh, how to evacuate and where to evacuate. And it's based on several things, how, how fast it's spreading or, or the magnitude of it or the intensity of the, um, the plume of, of a hazardous materials or, or how long it would, it's potentially going to last because that will affect um, if it's even a good idea to evacuate people. So all of that is in consideration and, and they factor in how many people actually need to go and how long it's gonna take because uh, we know that it, it takes longer than you would think. And then how far would they have to go to get to a safe area? So all of that is factored in and uh, considered and we take it very serious. Next slide. So you've heard of evacuation and there's, there's a little confusion about um, what an evacuation, uh, what it means, the message that you hear. So there's kind of different levels based on the severity of it. So there's an advisory uh, or sometimes it would be considered a, a pre-advisory uh, so that would be um, a heads up for you. We, there, there's a fire going on. We have crews on scene. You uh, might smell smoke, but uh, we just want you to know that, that this is taking place and to be aware of that and to pay attention. A evacuation warning would be that there's an actual uh, threat and that there's a concern. And if you have some reason why it would take you longer to evacuate. Maybe you might have some access and functional needs or uh, large animals or something like that. That would be a good time to start leaving. And when there's a big incident and a lot of people evacuating, the people that get on the road the fastest are the ones who usually get out uh, best. And they usually get to drive out where others might have to, to walk. An evacuation order is really a very serious thing. That means there's an immediate threat of life. Uh, and uh, you'll hear uh, police cars and fire engines, maybe public address system. Um, you'll, you'll know that it's serious and it's time to leave right then. And uh, unfortunately, there are people that have, have ignored those orders and maybe gathered some of their materials and then didn't have enough time to actually evacuate. And those are very sad situations. So uh, we take it very serious and it's very important. Uh, when you're asked to evacuate, please get out as fast as you can and make sure that you take one car and, and do the best to, to evacuate whoever, uh, whoever you might have around you. Uh, you might want to notify your neighbors if they didn't hear that or somebody else. And uh, also remember your pets. So another option would be to shelter in place. So it might be that that's the best decision to uh, leave people where they're at, uh, let the emergency blow over. They're safer in their house than in a car or they're safer indoors than outdoors. And so sometimes you'll hear a shelter in place order. And that's another, um, another good strategy that's, that's an option. So <clears throat> one of the uh, most famous fires is, is of course the campfire, which happened in Paradise, California. And I remember that day 
Um, I just got off work and it was a Thursday morning <clears throat> in November. And you would think November, it's almost the holidays were fine. And I remember when that went out and uh, I had the opportunity to respond up there the next day and then to, to help some people that were actually uh, looking for loved ones. And um, we have a video that we'd like to show you that, that I think um, gives the best feeling of what an evacuation would feel like. And maybe you've seen this, but I think it's good to review. It's, it's real short. This is at <clears throat> approximately noon. And it was so dark, everybody had their lights on. Uh, there was fire on both sides of the road. Uh, what was normally maybe a 10 or 15 minute drive to Chico from the town of Paradise, that's where my wife grew up, was uh, more like a four hour trip down there. And some of the people up in the higher areas in Megalia and, and back um, a little bit higher up on the hill, uh, were very lucky to get out. And it's because they had a plan and they had um, they had talked about it and practiced the plan in the community. So there's really just two roads that go out of paradise. And uh, at the end, when the traffic got really bad, then um, they ended up having to push vehicles off the road with a bulldozer to to make room for the firefighting crews to get through. So that was a, a terrible situation, but also uh, a great blessing that that more people didn't die and, and uh, weren't affected. So we'd like to talk a little bit about <clears throat> evacuation in Alameda County. So let's uh, it looks like that slide. Well, let's let's try to run it. Seems like we're having uh, some Internet problems. But there's a lot of these. I understand they're, they're looking at making a, uh, a feature film about that because of some of the amazing stories of uh, people fleeing for their life. <clears throat> you can see the, the next day, there were still things burning, how the wind pushed the fire into different areas. And so some neighborhoods were not affected at all and, and other neighborhoods were completely devastated. And uh, this is right as you come out of or off the hill of paradise and uh, what a great feeling to get out of that smoke and that heat. So Alameda County is made up of approximately 13 different jurisdictions. And uh, we're all kind of together. We all butt up against one another and so, if you evacuate one area, you might affect the, the neighboring area. You don't want to evacuate our people into an area that they're trying to evacuate. And so we, we realize that it's important that we have a plan that works good for everybody that we can collaborate on. And so um, for a while now, there's been a, a group, a work group, especially dedicated to this problem. And so this the Alameda County <clears throat> is now divided up into over a thousand zones and uh, they're uh, designed to be able to, uh, it's kind of like a little neighborhood. And then those zones would have uh, different plans to evacuate each of the different zones. So let, let's go on and talk a little bit about that some more on the next slide. So the company, that um, that came up with the zones and, and helped us with this is called Zone Haven. And it's specifically designed just for that. And they're, they're doing this all over the Bay Area. It was very successful in the CZU fire that happened last year. They had zones and they had plans and uh, they were able to be very efficient. So the tools that this provides for us is uh, first of all, consistent messaging so that everybody knows what we're talking about. When we identify a zone, uh, all, all of the first responders know exactly where that zone is at and, and what is meant by that. Uh, we've identified multiple route options and thought those through before the incident. And then this allows us to coordinate, like I mentioned, with our neighboring jurisdictions. 
and figure out the most efficient flow of traffic. So imagine if you if you just put out a general message and said, everybody evacuate. The, the roads are already pretty backed up on a on a busy day, on a on a rush hour. And if you evacuate all the zones at the same time or the whole area or evacuate areas that would be unnecessary based on, on the uh, information that is in the incident command post, then it just clogs up the roads. And so you have to come up with a very efficient way. And so the zones will be evacuated based on traffic flow, based on how fast the incident is, is developing and what zones would be affected first. And so all that is taught, thought out real well. And then um, we'll, we'll talk a lot about knowing your zone and knowing what zone you're in and, and practicing which uh, way you get out. But the idea is that uh, you might not be able to go where you, where you think you want to go. You might not be able to get onto the freeway, for example. So there'll be pre-designated uh, temporary evacuation areas where it's going to be safe for you to be but it's not going to uh, clog up the rest of the major arteries. And so we'll talk more about that. And also this will all be fully integrated with the public alert system. So as a uh, incident develops and the zones are identified, the software will automatically uh, send a notification to Waze, for example, and, and will, uh, will update ways and so that people will be uh, rerouted around the affected area. It will also be uh, tied in with social media and you'll be able to see um, how that's going. The plan is this is kind of an example page that shows uh, what a zone would look like and this would be available to all the first responders. So as we, as we finish up all of the details and all of the zones, all the things that would be affected, then this will get printed into a book and then placed in every first responder vehicle. And so that any first responder will be able to make intelligent um, decisions based on the pre-designated decisions and the evacuation plans for that zone. So let's go on to the next slide. So Hayward has, uh, approximately 92 zones right now, 92 different neighborhoods. And we've gone through and this software also has different layers depending on the type of emergency. So we know the elevation, we know uh, the weather, we, we know everything about the potential um, hazards that could be. So along our, our coastline, we know the tsunami inundation zones and we we have a plan for that and we know where the water will be based on the type of tsunami and and uh, we also have the ability to uh, identify target hazards maybe some some facilities that are a little more critical uh, critical evacuation facilities like uh, some of our board and care homes or some of our schools or hospitals and then we'll be able to identify the temporary evacuation areas, depending on the type of emergency it is. Another great thing about this is we can click on one of those zones on uh, any platform, it's all web-based, and it will tell the incident command team how many vehicles are in that zone, how many houses are in that zone, how many people expect it any, any time of day. Um, there's some areas have more people during the day than at night, and we can also simulate uh, fires or incidents uh, based on even the, the historical weather data. So this example right here was based on a fire that happened years ago. And we looked up the date and we looked up the time of day and then we were able to simulate exactly how that fire will go. And so the, the yellow would be the first half hour and the orange the next hour and then the, if, it, if it continues unchecked it goes on to the red. And so we can click these different zones and then automatically identify um, how many people are there, the evacuation points, and then uh, have an ability to, to contact the individuals that live in that, in that area. 
So let's go on to the next slide. Okay, be ready. Uh, this is a picture of our um, fire engine that uh, is from the Office of Emergency Services. You see the OES on the back. So Hayward firefighters staff that engine and we, and, and we uh, assist in the mutual aid system all over the state of California. So I'm not sure where, which fire this is at, but this is the, obviously at an actual fire. So, so um, um, some things um, that we could, um, oh, the other thing I wanted to point out is uh, because we send out firefighters to, you know, to, to uh, different fires all over the state, um, rest assured that we don't send out all of our firefighters so that we can't handle incidents uh, here in Hayward and, and Fairview. So we always have enough staff and uh, uh, resources, um, apparatus and so forth to handle all the local emergencies. So um, wanted to clarify that. Um, some things that we can do to be ready. Uh, one of the things is, you've heard this before, is a go kit, okay? Um, the whole uh, next hour and a half that, or hour that we have, uh, could we could talk about this? Um, you know, what to put in your go kit, uh, what's essential, what's non-essential, what's a good idea, what's, uh, you know, what's necessary. Uh, but what we're going to do is reference you to, uh, refer you to um, um, our website. So again, that's hayward-ca.gov. Uh, the fire department is on the top left. You, you click on that, you go to uh, disaster preparedness, and uh, there's a list, okay, of, uh, of, you know, good ideas what to put in your go kit. Okay, so um, what we suggest is, is to have three go kits for each member of your household, okay? Uh, well, depending on, on, you know, the age of the individual, but, you know, if you have kids, obviously they don't need a go kit for work. Uh, you could maybe get one for school. So what we suggest is uh, for one for home, one for work, and one for your car, because you never know where you're going to be at when a disaster strikes, okay? That covers everything from fires to earthquakes, you name it. Okay, so we always want to be prepared. So uh, in your home, uh, that go kit is going to be in a conspicuous place, somewhere where you're not going to forget it, you know, right there by the front door, um, you know, that you could just grab and go and get out of the area. The one in your car is not going to be in a conspicuous uh, place because um, that's what thieves look for is uh, backpacks in your car. So don't do that, put that in your trunk. Also want to keep those out of direct sunlight if you can, because you know the things inside can get hot, they can go bad on you and, and stuff like that. So um, you want to basically pack things that are you know essential that you can survive, you know, for 24 hours on. All right. Obviously, we need water. Um, we always recommend one gallon of water per person per day. OK, so um, in your vehicle, it's always a good idea to, to keep water, um, extra uh, bottles of water. OK, in your go kit uh, in a bag, you're probably going to get something smaller because I don't I, I, you know, I don't think you're going to carry a whole gallon of water in a backpack. But, you know, you can you can you know, get like a pint of water, you know, um, REI, Dick Sporting Goods. You know, they sell those camping uh, um, water containers that the water doesn't, you know, uh, it lasts a lot longer. So um, some essential items, you know, that just to, to talk about um, are not some non-perishable food, a flashlight because, you know, if it gets dark, you're gonna need light, obviously. Uh, first aid kits, very, very important because if you get injured, um, who's gonna be there to take care of you? You need to take care of yourself, okay? Um, Another good item is a hand crank radio. Uh, what those do is if you if you um, power those up, it provides a car charger, a flashlight, and obviously a radio. So you can you know listen to communication. So um, other thing is a hard copy of local maps. So you know, um, you know, we're talking about technology, uh, Waze. If you don't know what Waze is, Waze is an app for you know all, all of us commuters. If, if, you, if you're a commuter, you know what Waze is because it, it tells you which way you know is the best route to take. So um, if that's not uh, readily available, you have hard copies of maps, then you know you can always refer to those. Those don't go, but those don't, you know. Uh, you can always rely on those. Um, the other thing is um, um, your pets, okay? So if you have a dog, cat, you know, uh, whatever you have, 
Um, those are part of those, the, you know, the dog or, or cat. I have dogs, part of my family. I would I absolutely be devastated if something happened to them. I'm sure you would too. So what we're going to do is we're going to prepare a go kit for them as well. So in that, you're going to have essential things, um, you know, like uh, food and water, um, a, a bowl for them. Um, because um, if you're, you know, stranded on the side of the road or, or whatever the case may be, you're in a temporary evacuation area, you're going to have something to contain the water so they can drink out of it, right? Uh, medicines, if, you're, if, you're, if your pets uh, take medicine, make sure you, you know, pack that uh, with you as well. The other thing is crating animals um, or your pets. So um, if you think about this, if you're driving through like what that video showed you, do you think your your animals are going to be uh, very anxious and and acting up and you know causing confusion to you while you're trying to get out of there in a high stress situation? If you put them in a crate, they're they're going they're in a controlled environment. And also, if you have to go to a shelter, uh, a lot of the shelters will require uh, pets to be crated. Okay, so make sure you uh, um, if you're able to uh, bring a crate if you can fit it in your car. Um, or your truck, um, then do that. Um, okay, you can change the slide. <clears throat> All right, so now we're going to talk about how to evacuate. Um, the only thing wrong with this picture is it's facing towards the the uh, towards the house. Okay, one of the things that we're going to talk about is taking that car and facing it around. So you have one less thing to think about. You don't have to back up into a busy street. You can just drive out and get out of there, okay? You see the car is, is loaded up with, uh, with essential items, um, packed really, really well. Um, so, you know, that's the goal there. Um, you wanna take the most essential things. Um, you know, we, what you could do is if you have documents, you know, your social security cards and, and things like that, if you put them in a binder, um, um, you know, a wedding uh, a license or certificate, whatever that's called, uh, birth certificates, uh, home owners insurance policies, things like that. Um, if you put them in a binder uh, uh, in one spot, that, that's easy to grab and, and, and take instead of searching throughout the house looking for this and that when you need to to get out in a hurry. The other thing is to take photos of those and put them on a small thumb drive, okay? So that's some of the things you can do. Um, when you leave, uh, close all your doors and windows and vents, uh, and that prevents drafts that could help save your home uh, if, if you know, the fire gets close to your house, so. Um, leave driveway gates open if you live in a, you know, a gated, uh, at, at a gated residence. Um, and what that does is allows emergency crews to get in there uh, without having to cut the, take time to cut the uh, chain or the lock uh, to get inside so we can get in there a lot, a lot quicker. Um, drive cautiously out of the area. Um, you saw in the video, uh, I think the person was doing a, a pretty adequate job of um, functioning during a really stressful, high stress uh, um, incident. So uh, you want to make sure, you know, that you're able to get out carefully. So drive carefully, not, you know, speeding and, you know, uh, uh, really panicky. So I know it's hard, but, you know, try to focus on that. Um, and if you can get out of the area, if you don't have to go to a temporary uh, evacuation area, if you can straight shot to get out of, out of there, get out of there. Um, one of the things that we want to make sure of is that we don't encounter, or if we do encounter down power lines, that we make sure that we don't touch those. We treat those as everything is live, okay? We do that in the fire ground. If there's a cable wire, uh, we treat it as live until we prove it's not. So make sure you don't um, drive over um, power lines, touch power lines, basically. Um, and you can advance the slide. Help. Okay, if you're trapped, um, uh, Captain Wheeler was talking about if you have to uh, shelter in place. Um, so if you're if you have to evacuate and you couldn't get out and you needed to shelter in place, you have to make sure that you're able to to notify somebody that you're still trapped in your house. Okay, so we use that kind of as a last resort if we're trapped and and we have nowhere else to go. 
uh, some things that you can do. Uh, make sure that you stay together. Your family stays together. You don't want uh, you know any family member to leave, and then you're in, staying in the house. Uh, you want to stay together. Uh, stay in your home. Keep all doors and windows closed, uh, but keep them unlocked so that emergency personnel, uh, law enforcement, can get in and to uh, to assist you. Um, if you have flammable drapes or uh, curtains, uh, you want to make sure you pull those um, out of the way or pull them off the wall, get them away from the window so that the radiant heat doesn't uh, catch those on fire and catch the interior of your home on fire. Um, put a large help sign in the front window. That would be uh, um, an indicate, indicator for uh, fire crews and law enforcement to uh, make, you know, to go in there and get uh, anybody that's trapped out of the house. Uh, keep calm. Remember that it's four to five times hotter outside than it is inside. So, um, you know, if you're tempted, if you're tempted to leave your house, um, then remember that, you know, it's, it's a lot hotter out there. Um, if you're trapped in your vehicle, like, so if you're evacuating, uh, like the person was in the video, um, and you come to a place where, um, uh, in your, that you're trapped, um, try to find a place that's clear of vegetation. It's kind of like a, like an earthquake. Um, you want to go to a place you don't, uh, that is clear, uh, doesn't have anything that can fall over on top of you, uh, like a down power line, a, a falling tree, um, and uh, clear fuel. So if, you know, the weeds are this high, uh, that's not a good place to go. So try to get to, you know, a clear uh, spot, you know, where maybe there's grass or something like that, you know, that's green. Um, so, you know, that, that's some place that you can go uh, to be safer. Um, but the idea of, um, or the ideal of evacuating early um, shouldn't even um, be a, a, a concern because if you, if you evacuate early, then you won't have to deal with getting trapped. Okay, so hopefully you take all the advice, you know, from, from this and every anytime that there's an evacuation warning, you go ahead and evacuate, okay, before there's an actual order to evacuate. Um, if you are trapped in your vehicle, uh, one of the things that, that I found is um, if you take like your sunshade that you know goes on your 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 windshield, you know to prevent like uh, your your car from getting hot or the um, dashboard from cracking from the sun, put that up. That uh, deflects the um, the radiant heat. Try to get on on uh, your floorboard if possible. Um, and then if you're trapped on foot, same thing there. Uh, try to find an open space, uh, clear of fuels, clear of falling debris. Um, and um, just remember that there's going to be a lot of smoke. So make sure um, that you pack that N95 mask uh, to help you uh, uh, filter out all the smoke. Okay, you can advance the slide. Okay, this slide, uh, we're going to be talking about evacuation preparedness. Okay, we talked a little bit about go kits. Um, what I always suggest uh, uh, to people is, um, Build a go kit from um, basically from the ground up, if you will. Uh, buy a backpack and start storing the things that that is customizable to your needs. Okay, so like you know, say if you take medication um, or you take vitamins or something like that, you know that that make you feel better. Um, pack those in there. Um, eyeglasses, uh, things of that nature. And like I said earlier, we could talk about this for the rest rest of the uh, workshop. But um, you see on the bottom there uh, the links to the uh, uh, our disaster preparedness site. So um, customize it. You know, buy a little bit at a time, but make sure you have um, a, a go kit that or a go bag that's um, accessible. Um, you know, at home, work, and um, in your car. Okay. Um, the other thing is, go kits are not. They do not last forever. So every year. What you should do is uh, maintain those. Make sure that um, you know uh, you have um, um, your your needs change. You know uh, now you, you didn't wear glasses before. Now you do. Uh, so pack some glasses in there. You know. So every year go through it. Make sure everything is um, up to par. Um, communication. Um, what we're trying to do here is 
uh, stay off the phone lines because that jam packs the uh, communication system, right? So um, if everybody's on the phone making uh, phone calls, um, you're gonna have trouble getting out. So what we're gonna suggest is texting uh, people. So as, uh, and do not send pictures. I know it's gonna be uh, challenging. Uh, you know, this is this is what's going on. You know, you see the picture of the fire uh, that actually clogs up the communication lines as well. So uh, what we want to do is just text and stay off the phone. Um, what we always suggest is getting a hold of somebody that is out of the area or what we call an out of state contact person. So that say um, you are um, evacuating and um, your son or daughter is. Uh, out of the area um, and you want to you know tell them that you're okay use the out-of-state contact person um, and then they can check in as well so and update them um, you know when you evacuate and then when you're safe in the safe zone okay so make sure you uh, so that nobody is you know coming to look for you um, and if uh, Report any found persons who were reported missing, you know, so if you couldn't get a hold of uh, somebody and you think that they're, they're in their, you know, didn't evacuate or whatever, um, and, you, and you find them to be safe, make sure you, you know, let somebody know about that. Um, well, the next thing we'll talk about is neighbors. So as a community, uh, what we're trying to uh, do is uh, build uh, relationships here, okay? Um, and you know it takes um, it takes everybody help from everybody to successfully uh, be prepared in your uh, community in your neighborhood. So um, people that might need help, uh, um, and we'll get to that on the next uh, topic, <coughs> is access, uh, access and functional needs. So um, people with uh, mobility issues, developmental, cognitive, hearing, or language issues. Um, we need to uh, take care um, of those those people that are in need that may need help evacuating. So um, that's what we could do as neighbors, um, knowing their schedules, uh, knowing your neighbor's schedules, uh, if they go on vacation or something like that. Um, know that they're not going to be there to assist you if you need if you need assistance. Um, Make sure there's a lot of redundancy in that, you know, so it, it, you know that if so and so is out of town, your other neighbor is going to take care of you, um, it, you know, if you need assistance or you're going to provide assistance to somebody that that needs help. OK, uh, and that applies to children as well. Um, um, select a neighborhood block captain. So somebody that's going to take charge. Um, we get this a lot um, and, and I've uh, been to a lot of um, neighborhood uh, meetings, uh, homeowners association meetings and things like that, where we talk about um, disaster preparedness. So uh, someone needs to take that on and communicate, organize something uh, within your, your neighborhood and, um, you know, and seek out training opportunities. And we'll get to that in a second. Um, um, let's see, I already talked about access and functional needs. Um, Pets. So we talked a little bit about pets, um, having their own go, go bag. Uh, make sure you bring leashes, um, water dishes, medications. That, I kind of already talked about that. But um, if there's smoke outside, um, like I said earlier, um, when there's fires that are far away and we get a lot of smoke here, uh, make sure that your pets are inside, okay? Because the pets can't wear the masks and stuff like that, okay? So... Um, Keep a collar on your pet with an ID tag. Um, and, you know, if possible, uh, have your pet microchip so you can find them wherever they're at. Um, you know, if you, if you do happen to lose them in, uh, you know, during an evacuation or after an evacuation. Um, also have photos of your pets. Uh, I know everyone does. Uh, have one with um, you and your pet so that you can, uh, it, it would be easily identifiable that that is your dog or cat or whatever. Um, for larger animals, uh, make sure that you have a plan in place that, that can get those animals like horses uh, transported out of the area and into a safe, uh, safe zone, okay? Um, one of the key points here 
is if you must leave without your pets, leave gates and uh, downwind windows open. So if the fire is approaching from this way, uh, leave this window open so that you know if the if the uh, animal is you can't find it and you need to evacuate to sit to save your life. Um, give them a fighting chance to get out. So um, and then don't open the fire window that's closest to the fire uh, because that's going to introduce heat and, and um, um, embers and things like that into your house. So. Um, Try to take your pets with you, but don't become a fatality when trying to save them. Um, you know, I, I'm sure you've heard of uh, different people, you know, going back to get their house, whether it's just a house fire or it's an actual wildland fire. Uh, people have, you know, risked their lives and um, and actually, you know, perished in, in these uh, fires uh, for trying to go back and get their animals. So remember, your life is the most important. OK. All right. Next slide. I think that's you. So <clears throat> we uh, we want to talk a little bit about uh, some questions. We see that there's some questions. We just can't see what the questions are. So if someone has a question about any of this, this would be a good time. Maybe we can. Anybody uh, have a question that we haven't answered yet? I think these are old. Yeah. OK. All right, let's go on. So <clears throat> we know that Don and I have been doing this a long time, and we, we know now that if you don't act on this plan tonight or within the next 24 hours, the chances that you're going to prepare uh, drop off dramatically. So it's important to to take the opportunity while you're thinking about that to prepare. So <clears throat> you've, you've signed up for AC alert. And so you're going to get notified. You have a backup battery for your phone. You've put together your go kit. You have taped a checklist of the things that you want to do and bring inside the cabinet where the cookie jar is. So you look at it often. You've picked a designated contact person and um, really the best thing to do after you've got that in place is the best practice is to actually practice. So think about um, the different scenarios. Involve your family, involve your kids. Uh, emergencies have a tendency to come at inconvenient times. If your kids are at school and your spouse is at work or your um, in-laws are in town and, and uh, you know, whatever the scenario is, try to think all those through and talk it through and have each member of the family understand the plan. And so that will relieve a lot of anxiety. There's a good chance that if an area has been evacuated, you won't be able to go in and look for somebody. So that's the beauty of having an established meeting place and an established out of area contact. And you can tell that we could really talk for days about this, but we're, we'll try to move it on a little faster. So explore different routes out of your neighborhood. If, if one route is blocked with down wires, have, have a second plan that you've explored on a, on a beautiful day instead of uh, during an emergency. So um, along with you practicing this, the city and all the first responders are going to practice this as, as well. So. We are going to continue ongoing development and um, some degree of tests with the uh, notification systems. We want to make sure that they work. We just don't want to uh, wear out the message. We want it to be uh, functioning, but not um, become common. Uh, we'll do internal tabletop exercises where we, we discuss with the different departments throughout the city uh, different scenarios where we, we plan and, and discuss the best and most efficient way to execute an evacuation. We're going to do some uh, public address drills where we actually will send out a message and ask that the people that get the message actually do something. Maybe um, you can test your, your system and how long it takes you to get 
your family and your, your puppy into the car with your go bags and get down to a specific spot. So we'll, we'll have these ongoing drills and uh, we're, we're working on that throughout the, the rest of this year and moving forward. And there's also going to be a uh, big advertising campaign to discuss know your zone. And so we want you to know which, which zone is yours, where to uh, go to find information on your zone and know the best ways out of your zone. So we have that going on and, and uh, we know we're short on time, but we'd like to, we'll change the slide and put up the address again to AC Alert. This is the first step um, to be notified of what's happening. This is a system that has all been established, tested, and we really want you to opt into that and encourage your neighbors to opt into that as well. So is there any questions that we, we haven't covered? Like, we'll just leave that up for a minute so you can write that down. And it looks like there's a bunch of questions. Okay, let's see if we can do that. Uh, I'm try gonna unmute some, some participants to let them ask their question. You got that. Let's see, I tried raising my hand. I'm curious to know how specific egress routes produced by Zone Haven. Oh, okay. So um, the, the routes and the traffic control points are really going to be uh, developed by people in house. So they give us the tools to be able to indicate where they'll be on the map, uh, a wealth of advice and uh, experience that they can bring. But the the little idiosyncrasies of each of the different neighborhoods uh, will all be um, reviewed carefully and indicated by uh, police and fire and, and everybody that's involved. Um, different scenarios will have different uh, exit plans, of course. So if the, if the wind is blowing out of the east, we're, we're gonna, we, we want you to exit a different way. So there's not gonna be necessarily a set plan for every neighborhood because uh, it, it could change. Some neighborhoods only have uh, one way out and, and may have some emergency evacuation uh, gates or EVAs. Uh, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that too. So let's see, you wanna talk about gas cans? I'm um, sure. Uh, what should we do with gas cans, propane tanks prior to evacuation placed in a certain spot? Um, yeah, you, you want to make sure that you get those away from your home as much as possible. And I know some of you might live in a, uh, a community uh, and some are in more rural areas. Um, what I would suggest is getting those away from your house um, um, as far away as possible um, to so that uh, because if they were right next to your house, uh, that's going to be one of the first things to, uh, you know, um, cause the fire uh, to spread really rapidly. Um, okay. Let me take this one. So uh, the question is, would you prefer a sign if you have a pool in your backyard so that we can uh, draft out of that water? Uh, we have a great water delivery system. Uh, if there is a need for helicopters to, to dip out of pools, we've seen that happen and they're very talented. Uh, they can see the pools from above, and we also have uh, Google Maps and Google Earth and, uh, and all the tools. So probably not that necessary. Um, a lot of pools we can't access because uh, if we're going to draft water straight out of the pool right into a fire engine, it, it makes it very difficult unless we can get very close. So one thing that is helpful is if you have evacuated, you can put a sign on your house that says evacuated. And so that the first responders don't have to go door to door in every case, that time is going to be critical. And if we can save time by eliminating the houses that have been evacuated, that gives us more time to focus on, on maybe someone with special needs. Um, there, are, there are several gates in our community that could be uh, open, but we are unclear what the interdepartmental uh, communication is to open those gates when an emergency arises. You have that answer? So um, you, these are probably gates that you don't even notice. Maybe at the end of a, of a street, there's a, there's a gate and then a little uh, road that goes off. 
they call those EVAs or emergency vehicle access gates. And we have them throughout the, the hills especially. And it allows us different access to different areas. And so uh, some of those gates, um, uh, all of the gates, we have a key that will open each of those gates. And so in the case of an emergency, any fire vehicle will be able to open those gates. Uh, there's a gate on Thurston Court, for example, and uh, we realize that uh, we might be busy in a fire. And so this particular gate is in the process of being converted so that it can be opened remotely, uh, either by a remote control in a fire apparatus or even through dispatch. And uh, we're, that, that was a joint venture through the Hayward Fire Department uh, Fairview Fire Department and or Fairview Fire Protection District and Alameda County. It's expensive to do that. You have to run power to it, but uh, we're open to uh, doing that as soon as we can possibly get funding. And those are being prioritized now. And uh, there may be other ways that we can we can discuss in using um, uh, some of our partners to to find a way to get those open. I think, uh, did we hear correctly? Oh, Thurston. there's Thurston Court right there, yeah. So Thurston Court is not operational yet. We're still waiting for uh, the final on the electricity. It's it's a, currently a uh, a chain, but it's in the process and they're working on it. Is that your understanding too? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, let's see. Uh, with Fairview Avenue being just a two-lane road and the fire is approaching from both sides of the road, as in the video is shown, what is the best way to evacuate, um, such as stay in your vehicle or on foot? Um, what I would suggest is uh, trying to safely drive out of the area. I hope that answers your question, but that is the main goal is to not get trapped. So, um, you know, that that's, that's, uh, shows you the importance of evacuating early. And you know um, everything, taking everything into consideration, the fire weather. Uh, it's a red flag warning. Be prepared uh, when you hear you know a, a evacuation warning. Uh, you get out safely, and uh, there's no um, delay whatsoever. So you don't have to encounter this situation. So that's basically the best uh, scenario that, that we could suggest there. I think unless you have something else. Yeah, it's hard to know, you know, if you're stuck in traffic and the fire is all around your vehicle, maybe you're safer in the vehicle. We, we know from the uh, Paradise Fire that uh, some people stayed in their vehicle and were fine. Other people uh, got out and, um, and did better out. It's going to be really difficult to know. I know that in general, it's going to be hot and terrible out there and there'll be embers blowing like uh, snowflakes at you. So uh, if you can get out early, uh, that's a much better plan, but um, it, it's difficult to know based on the conditions. Um, fireworks have been increasing in the Fairview area. What are your thoughts? Is there any action being taken by the fire department? Um, every year I'm part of a campaign to um, get the word out via social media, mailers, everything you could think of to let every signs, uh, road signs, every, the problem is uh, there's neighboring uh, cities that allow safe and sane fireworks. Everything in Hayward and Fairview is off limits, no fireworks whatsoever. So every year we try to get the word out. And unfortunately, uh, we have uh, people that, you know, just don't, um, uh, you know, don't take the message seriously. And any time uh, there are fireworks, you know, we take that very seriously. Um, but it, it's very hard to apprehend the people, give them citations, uh, uh, because, you know, they're lighting these fireworks that are going off in the, in the air. Um, and by the time, you know, the police department gets there, because the police and fire are having a crazy night. You can only imagine all the calls that they're getting, uh, you know, close to the 4th of July. Um, so trying to, you know, run down people, trying to, you know, confiscate their fireworks, um, you know, so it, it's, it's a very difficult task. So, you know, please understand that, you know, you know, we try our best every year. We, we have extra staffing. We uh, put uh, patrols up in the, in the hills, uh, patrols uh, down in the flats. 
everywhere. We we just have extra staff, and so does the police department. But you know, it's just very a very difficult task to uh, you, you know to uh, to problem to fix. So I hope that answered your question. Um, so ham radio, we uh, we would love to talk to you if you're a ham radio operator. Um, we'd like to uh, build that up again and uh, learn a little bit more about that, how that works. Uh, we had a ham radio uh, club that we worked with in the past, and uh, I think that's been dissolved. So we would love to talk to you. Well, I, if you if you know anybody that is a ham radio operator, let us know. So. You know what? I'm going to jump in, you guys, as Chief Contreras. Uh, I'm going to try and move us along so that we can get to that presentation, um, potentially, that Ms. Richardson wanted us to take a look at. Uh, if we can, um, it, there's a, a few questions about specifics of evacuation. And part of the goal tonight was to preheat everybody, pardon the pun, but to preheat everybody a little bit on what Zone Haven is because we're getting a lot of questions about evacuation. We've been working on this for 18 months as has every fire department and police agency in the county. And we're just about ready to roll out. And, and we're at that point uh, come June 1, we're gonna be able to talk about more specifics of the evacuations. You'll be able to download your own maps um, and we'll be able to tabletop exercise with your community groups and, and what have you as we as we build the familiarity with the zone haven system we're building it from scratch um, and it, it is successfully being operated in two other counties and i believe all nine barrier counties are going to be on zone haven um, uh, by the end of this fire season but we're next in line for june 1st um, the Hayward Boulevard thing com has come up a lot. We have um, publicly stated that we are opposed to that narrowing of Hayward Boulevard, and we will continue in our opposition to that. It's just not uh, a well thought out plan, and we've made that very clear that from an access and egress standpoint, we have concerns uh, and have not been met with a great deal of resistance. Another question about the goats. The goats are coming in. Ward Creek, um, your Durham Road property, um, will be affected by where the goats will be. They will be here the first week of June. Uh, the different fire gates, we're going to be going through a, a series of uh, evaluations of the existing EVAs and making proposals for any of those EVAs that can be electrified um, using the Thurston gate as the model. So Thurston and Lori Way, um, that was kind of a prototype uh, as soon as it gets powered up, then we will model the rest of the EVAs after that successful implementation. Uh, all the narrow uh, areas and references to narrow streets, those are uh, obviously geographical features of not just the Hayward Hills, but the Fairview area in general. Uh, and that's the reason why Zone Haven is going to be a huge solution for us to move towards safe, establishing safety zones. Um, and not necessarily if, if there are times of the day that fires happen, um, where people, you know, to the question of 49 homes in a single neighborhood, um, we may be identifying with the neighborhood of safety zones within the neighborhood and being uh, aware of those things. And we're going to build that out with you all together. Uh, we're not going to make assumptions that we know all of your concerns. We're going to learn from uh, these sessions with you. And if we need to do more workshops, um, we will continue to do workshops until the community at large feels like their questions have been answered. Um, with that, we had a proposal with a lot of uh, really good ideas, a very thoughtful approach. The Kelly Hill neighborhood, as uh, most know, is in the Fairview district. Um, and I think it's one example of the community coming together and uh, attempting to solve a problem. And I think it's a, a problem that we've been working on and now to partner with that community group to implement their ideas of what they wanna see on the, the Kelly Hill neighborhood um, and utilizing the technology we're bringing to bear is gonna be very helpful. Um, as far as the question about who implements an evacuation, so it's called for by the fire agencies and executed on by law enforcement. So the fire agencies are focused on uh, suppression operations uh, and everyone else is, uh, is focused on the evacuation process. So with that, um, if you are ready, Ms. Richardson, um, I think we can 
share your share Shauna Lee can share your screen and your presentation. Is that going to work, Charlie? Oh, there we go. And I believe Ms. Richardson has been unmuted. Or not. Cindy, are you there? Okay, we can't hear you. I see you in the chat. We can't hear you yet, uh, Cindy. Sean Lee will work on that. Uh, yes, the city, I, another question, uh, This when will the city have people doing weed? We're on the city right now about Skyline uh, and the, oh, Skyline Drive. Um, that's in process. That should have already been uh, abated. So I'll add that to my list. Uh, I thought you were talking Sky West Golf Course, which also needs to be abated now. We still can't hear Cindy. Hey, Chief, I'm trying to find Ms. Richardson. Is she, did she Raise call? Raise your me? hand. Well, <clears throat> well, we're getting short on time. Um, I was really hoping hand is raised. Um, someone can fill in for Sydney if she's not able to. Who is that education team? Do you see that as an option, Charlie? Sorry, everybody. We're usually pretty smooth with the Zoom. Hello? Uh, there yes. we go. Oh, hi. Yeah. Um, thank you so much, Chief Contreras. You you made this uh, presentation almost not necessary. Kelly Hill has been extremely concerned about their predicament of having one access and at entry to their area in case of fire. And we do have, and I'll, I'll just skip right through here. Um, all of the things that we did not know about it had not been announced that you are working on an evacuation plan. We did not know this. So we were trying to jumpstart one basically. And, uh, and we were getting very serious about getting a, um, uh, a, an evacuation plan specifically for this dense part of Fa uh, Fairview and especially um, Kelly Hill with its one entry and exit. And uh, there are potentially five gates out and they, they will happen if there's a real emergency because people will just plow over the gates basically. But since we are living in, um, you know, with potential fires every day, um, it's, it's getting pretty critical that we have an evacuation route and the EVA gates are prepared. Um, and we are certainly ready to jump in and help educate the public and get everybody on the same sheet of music. And we wanted to be uh, all this to be done by July 4 because that is like D-Day for um, fireworks. Uh, and last year, we saw so many days like this and um, there were a lot of acquaintances and myself who were kind of sweating it out every night as to uh, what if there's a fire. <laughs> um, and uh, again, we, we heard about um, budgets and timeframes, but we didn't hear anything specific. So we tried to encourage getting the evacuation 
plan out right away. We have the resources and, um, and we can do this and the information's there and obviously you're aware of it anyway. Um, and we had a final vision where um, the evacuation zones are set up, the escape routes are set up, the public knows what to do, and it's all tied into getting defensive perimeters and ev evacuation. It's together. Um, and the process, uh, there, there's a, a wealth of ways for people to inform each other, but basically we get a WA alert or call from family member, gather family, load vehicles, all the things that were covered today in, in this workshop, and then take established routes out. And then once that urgent um, part of evacuation is settled, then we can refine the process to include uh, shelter and reentry. And again, this is <laughs> with the hopes of just getting a evacuation plan started. And so going forward, um, I, I'm, I'm, I learned today that, uh, you know, the, this has been afoot for 18 months already. And so a lot of this, this pleading and urgency isn't necessary per se, but we do, do need something solid soon about uh, Kelly Hill. And, um, and we did our own research and there is a program that's up and running and really excellent. Um, I think it was the, uh, the county that uh, inspired the law to have a defensive perimeter. But anyway, here's a link to their, um, their program. And that's all I have to say. And I thank you very much, though, for the engagement and uh, preparation that I was heretofore not aware of. It, absolutely. Part of the reason, it, not that we were developing this in secret by any means, uh, but it definitely took some time. When we originally had our concepts um, of working with another neighboring jurisdiction, uh, it was quickly grabbed up by the rest of the agencies in the county, and um, we wanted to maintain consistency. So the delay was that, and then getting payment for the system from all of the jurisdictions was the next challenge, which we pulled our resources together and pulled that off. And we're funded now on Zone Haven indefinitely moving forward by all agency participation. So part of the, the goal wasn't to just pull something off the shelf per se, um, but to build something that is sustainable long-term that's recognizable for generations to come. And I, I think we're gonna accomplish that, but part of it is um, there is that anxiety. We are pushing up. Uh, into fire season. So we appreciate it. And the work that your group did, uh, Ms. Richardson, is exactly what we hope to see these meetings spur, is people working with neighbors to tell us your ideas, living in the neighborhood. No one knows it better than you do, even though we know the neighborhoods well. No one knows the tendencies um, and the ebbs and flow of the neighborhoods as well as you. Uh, and there's a lot of questions about um, for instance, functional needs and um, uh, people gaining access. Um, some of the questions in the chat uh, about how to be made aware. And we hope that um, through this process, we're going to make sure that it, anybody who's willing and able um, has the information that they need to know their zone and what to do in a case of emergency. And in those situations that we can't evacuate because of a specific geographical trait of a neighborhood, we'll have really solid plans on how we're going to come and um, just protect the people in, in, in some extreme uh, circumstances. So I see um, text in there. We, we want to hear from everybody. There's a, a chat in there about Machado Court and some of your thoughts out there having experienced a serious fire a few years back. Um, we want to hear from all of you. We, we want to make sure that this is your plan. And when we get it done, um, it's editable and can be changed as we learn together as a community on the best way to protect the, the WUI um, and, and all of the residents in, in the urban interface. So uh, that's definitely a, a high goal um, for the overall process. And this was just an opportunity because we were aware, originally we weren't gonna talk much about evacuation in this work soon, but we know it's top of mind for so many of you. And we wanted to share that there is something coming um, 
And I please know, Ms. Richardson, all of the work that you've done here in this uh, presentation is not going to be lost. Um, it's actually going to be very helpful and it'll be built out. The main difference between a lot of the other programs and Zone Haven is the polygon concept. Um, if Captain Wheeler, when he showed that slide, you can see um, the, the way a lot of the maps originally in, in ESRI and uh, in GIS and in general are done in a circular fashion and it's very hard to figure things out based on streets and, and entry points and what have you. And the polygon solution has really allowed us to draw accurate maps. Um, so depending on direction of travel of a flaming front, we can make those determinations based on the, the information on the ground in real time. Uh, so huge advancements coming and I wish it was last summer, uh, but uh, no better time than now. I think that takes us to the end. Do we have any other questions in the chat or anybody want to raise their hand? If we do have a few questions in the chat, um, we're happy to answer them and post them online, but I want to get to the hands that have been raised for a while, if you don't mind. Sure. Steven, I'm going to unmute you. Hi, my name is Steven Schott, and uh, I am the president of the Bailey Ranch HOA. Uh, one of the questions uh, uh, we have is, uh, uh, can how can we support you in uh, the, your efforts in responding to the uh, Hayward Boulevard feasibility study proposing to uh, reduce the, lane, the number of lanes from two to one and add traffic circles in areas that are already subject to high congestion like Hayward Boulevard and uh, Bailey Ranch Road. So right now the best answer to that is um, to continue doing what you're already doing and monitoring it closely because um, clearly you're aware of the issue. Uh, we have given our uh, initial feedback about the lane change um, proposals and the COFIC uh, calming devices. Um, there's a lot of things that are problematic about it, one of which is uh, a lot of what we've built out in Zone Haven is dependent on traffic going uh, monodirectional um, or having just an emergency vehicle access um, coming up the hill and all other lanes coming down the hill. So that obviously uh, changes things a lot and we're gonna be watching it closely. Um, that being said, we've got a long history of, of the city um, taking our uh, concerns into consideration and not really pushing back a whole lot. So I don't anticipate um, that uh, it's going to happen in the current form that it has. We've given that feedback and I'm optimistic that um, common sense will prevail and we'll end up with probably some traffic calming devices, but that don't impact uh, access and egress. And the next question I had was, I'm curious uh, if the fire department has a role in uh, uh, prospective changes to the neighborhood, like additional development uh, and the uh, things to improve evacuation routes. There's a, you know, definitely a choke point between uh, Skyline Drive and uh, all the way up to Stonebury where it's reduced to one lane. So the quick answer is a limited role. Um, you know, if a project meets California Fire Code current, then it can be built if it meets the uh, the code, the, the fire code, building code. And there's a lot of things that come into that grade of the hillside or, or the road um, and access. There's a lot of things that are, are played if it makes it through a sequel review. Um, and it's simply on the on the fire department, then the only requirement is and we can't deny a project based on um, it not being desirable. That's for the planning commission to do. Um, we apply in the WUI, in the wildland and urban interface, we have considerable uh, enhancements to the construction process in our wildland urban interface ordinance, which requires 
um, a beefing up of uh, building materials, sometimes sprinklers in the attic, uh, enclosed soffits around the exterior of the house, no wood decks, um, things of that nature, which sometimes can be a deterrent to uh, development because of the increased cost. Uh, of construction in the hills, but we do not have the ability to deny a project based off of that. That being said, we do have, you know, for instance, in the fire code, 96 foot cul-de-sacs in the wild and urban interface, hammerheads that accomplish a 96 foot uh, turnaround. Um, things of that nature, um, we do have those, um, <clears throat> those provisions. And sometimes we are, um, some, we get accused, for lack of a better term, of killing a project because we require 96 feet uh, in the wild and urban interface in particular. And most public works, including the county, require 80 feet cul-de-sac turn, um, courts, turnarounds. Um, so there's, we have that rub often enough. Um, so it's, it's not the first time. Uh, it's not our first rodeo on dealing with some of the access and egress stuff. I hope that answers your question, sir. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, I'm gonna unmute Kathy. Kathy, you can go ahead with your question. Yes, Kathy. I live on the corner of Maud and D, and I just want to applaud. Um, Chief Contreras and also Captain Nicholson, a fabulous job. I appreciate it so much. Um, I just want to address from the beginning that in the situation of the fires going forward, we know that there's natural hazards like wildfires, PGE, um, thunderstorms, but we are really experiencing firework activity. The fire season is all year long now. The firework season is all year long now. So this is really impacting us. And I've been told that, you know, the M80 is no longer there. It's now the M2000. Um, in addition, the building too close to wildlands is not our responsibility. It falls on the shoulders of developers and planners. So they need to be aware of that. Um, the, the situation with the wild, with the firecrackers, is that it's so prevalent every day, every night. And we need to try to take that into consideration and mitigate that. There is a spot uh, a shot spotter app and i've been told by shot spotters that they have been working with the hayward uh police department and but they can't they they don't have it adapted yet to fireworks but that would be something to consider that maybe in the future that shot spotter could be used to take care of fireworks and you know warn the sheriff's department or whatever about that. Um, I would hope that the technology goes forward to um, cite the firework people that are doing that because the people do not. The you know our people in our neighborhoods are reluctant to do that. But that's really a concerning situation. We've had fireworks thrown out of windows. Out of, out of cars um, and started a fire in, in, in Fairview Avenue. And um, that activity is really concerning. And we could not, you know, take care of it that way. So maybe mm -hmm. someone can answer that to me. Yeah. Definitely something. That, and I know, you know, the Fairview Fire District Board has been really pushing this issue hard as the, has the, uh, the city of Hayward. And it really is, it's a regional issue. We, we hear it across every city, uh, really, not just in our county, multiple counties. Um, it's, it's a huge problem. And it's, it's, it's understandable that people are concerned, um, like you, Kathy. It, it's uh, something that, you know, can literally keep you up at night. And um, 
that yet very difficult to enforce. Really, the supply chain is where the enforcement has to happen um, to be exactly. successful. Once they're in the resident's hand, um, the ability to enforce is really, really difficult because it's a constantly, literally a, a moving target. Um, and you have, as the frequency picks up closer to July 4th, it gets obviously even harder. I, I think the efforts that the Fairview District has done, you know, signs in places just kind of keep the honest honest. Um, and uh, I think increased patrols are something that both the Sheriff's Office and the Hayward Police Department have um, significant plans for this year. I do also know that there's a few different task forces working on the supply chain side of things. Um, it, both from the fire service and law enforcement working together from the fire marshal's office. Um, and those have been uh, our biggest success stories. I remember uh, two years ago, there were 63,000 tons of fireworks confiscated in Hayward um, off of one of those uh, type of enforcement efforts. And I think that's really what we're hoping to see the solution be is to prevent them from getting into the residents' hands in the first place. Um, we will stay on it. We will be diligent. Obviously, it's a law enforcement issue. Once somebody is breaking the law, um, we're there as suppression crews. We're not law enforcement uh, and don't have the authority necessarily to engage. We do if, uh, if the situation calls for it, but if it's at all dangerous, then we call law enforcement also. So we will continue on that, Kathy. We know it's, it's a very big concern and justifiably so, um, and hope to have some progress over the, the, the next few months and see some diminished fireworks. And thank you, Chief Contreras. Can I unmute again? Yes, please. Okay, so the other concern is that we had had a, a fire up on Upper D that was started by someone throwing out a cigarette butt. Okay, so we had another fire started by um, a contractor um, using a chainsaw on a limb in hot weather. And therefore we see this fire danger all the time and the problem is it, on D Street, Upper D Street, that when you get fire trucks going up there, there's no way for people to get down their cars or their trucks to, to evacuate. And they have to go on foot. And we don't have any sidewalks on D Street, Upper D Street. And I've been working with Public Works to get them to tell us when the design phase that's been approved will be approved. They don't tell us the date. So we have people that are probably going to have to evacuate on foot with no sidewalks. And some of those people are in wheelchairs. So tell me your thoughts on that. Yeah, we have, I mean, there's a lot of different spots like that throughout the community where access is not to modern standards. Uh, it wouldn't be approved today. Um, so anytime we identify those areas, we're always an advocate to see uh, increased public works um, kind of infrastructure improvements and something we're strong advocates of. Um, so it, it, in that particular case, we, we definitely are available to weigh in on what we would like to see uh, from an access and egress standpoint, if there is consideration. Um, oftentimes the county does reach out to us for input on access and egress. It's just a matter of when they um, execute on the plans and, and make those uh, changes happen. Um, but we can definitely bird dog that particular one. and. Um, keep you appraised of the information that I learned, Ms. Langley, if that would be helpful. Okay, we're gonna to move to the next question. Dale, would you like to ask your question? Okay, we'll give Dale a couple minutes. Um, Linda? Linda, do you still have a question? I don't know if this is the right Linda. Um, I had typed one in. I have a question about, um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, you talked about wildfires, but I'm also concerned about we live on the Hayward Fault. In a major earthquake, 
Mission Boulevard is probably not going to be available as an egress. And the only egress will be basically up to the Fairview area, which is very narrow now. What plans are you making that is going to address that, especially if it's during the day when schools are in session, uh, Cal State's in session, in session, or a weekend where you might have a golf court, uh, golf uh, tournament or something like that, where there's extra people all trying to get out at the same time. Well, the, the best way to exit large numbers of people is to maximize the lanes. Um, it, and that's what we were referring to. It, it's in all the system for evacuations that we are uh, going live with is an all risk system. So regardless of the threat, um, it's a smart system that's going to be fed the latest information off of uh, what's happening on the freeways, overall traffic routes, and that will inform our decisions in real time on what routes we open. And it's generally a law enforcement function to deal with how they get traffic moving, um, depending on where the impacted areas are. So, so much is, is an unknown. We're a huge step forward having Zone Haven to where we can communicate um, in real time in a systematic fashion through the AC alert system, but it's only as good as there are subscribers that are dialed into the system. Um, one of the things you don't hear us talking a lot about is iPods, which is the instant text messaging. Um, we will be in some capacity also using, using iPods over the course of time, um, but how some of those keys to the car get doled out over the course of time um, are still being determined and some of the privacy rights and things on what can be uh, sent out on an iPods alert. Um, will be coming hopefully in the near future. I think Dale's ready to unmute. Sorry. Hi, thank you for the second shot at this. Uh, gentlemen, thank you for the presentation, the PowerPoint. Thank you for this opportunity for the workshop. Chief, thank you for stepping in so we could, uh, could we ask our, our questions? I have a question, besides Cindy's report, which, you, which we saw part of, there's a report by a, another Fairview person, Ray Soda, that makes specific recommendations as to how to improve egress, how to improve our ability to get out, um, mostly above Maud and above uh, Kelly at Woodrow. And who do we contact to advance those suggestions? Who do we sit down with? At what point, what point can we, can we uh, who, who, what's the next step in terms of, of uh, 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 articulating the, the, the issues that Ray's raised and the many others that some other people have about uh, uh, making plans on getting out of here. I, Deputy Chief Vollmer is going to be the best point of contact for you, Dale. Um, and he'll be bird dogging us and making sure that nothing slips through the cracks. Uh, Captain Wheeler and uh, Captain Nicholson have specific roles in uh, disaster preparedness, but from an overall uh, responsibility standpoint, Deputy Chief Vollmer is, is uh, your best route. And I'm going to jump in, Dale, real quick. This is uh, DC Vollmer. And yeah, I, hi, Chief. Have, I have a copy of that uh, report that you were just talking about. And um, I'm actually going to be in a meeting tomorrow where we are going to be um, looking at some of the addressing the pre plans in the different zones in the WUI. So as we address those areas, I will definitely be um, bringing those considerations um, into play as, as we're looking at and assessing um, the pre-plans for those zones. So I will already be looking into those. Great, and we'll stay, with, stay in touch, touch with you for other opportunities, future opportunities for, for citizen involvement. Yes, sir. Okay, thank, thank you. You're very welcome. And uh, Chief, we're 15 minutes over time. If you want to, um, I guess, return everybody back to uh, to their lives for the rest of the evening, or if, if we want to take well, one more. Just real quick, because there's a question about East Avenue Park um, and how concerned we are about East Avenue Park. Um, and the overall... Uh, Ward Creek drainage is the area that I think you're uh, referring to. And we've got a series of projects going on uh, right now at the bottom of Plunge, at Plunge Park, at the bottom of the creek uh, at Mission, just above 
uh, Plunge Park. We've got a defensible space project that's going to be going on in there. It's also the reason why we put goats into Ward Creek so that we don't damage the riparian nature by doing a bunch of abatement, but we put the goats into Ward Creek um, to clear the ladder fuels so that we don't damage uh, the oak um, canopy, which is very healthy and safe and, and fire safe, but we eliminate the ground fuels, the sagebrush, the, uh, the chaparral, the chemise, all the stuff that's um, down in the canyon, including the non-native species, we use the goats to accomplish that. Um, so that was uh, Diane Doran. Doran. Uh, and as far as getting uh, children uh, um, out of school, if something happens, schools are generally, depending on the type of emergency, a shelter in place location where we will send resources to protect uh, that as opposed to trying to evacuate, um, it, at least in the immediate initial attack mode. Um, we would send resources as a target hazard within that district. There would be automatically resources headed there for structure protection and uh, life safety um, precautions to be taken. So with that, I want to thank everyone for uh, participating and, and thank you, Captain Nicholson and, and Captain Wheeler for your hard work here and Sean Lee for uh, making things happen behind the scenes and Norma. Uh, keeping everyone on point. Um, that's This is kind of your team. Um, and I hope for the community to see this group that's presenting here here tonight as your team and the WUI uh, safety of your neighborhoods as we move forward. This is not a one-time thing. It's not a one-year effort. Um, this has been a buildup for the last few years and we're gonna stay on it until every resident knows their zone. Um, and it feels comfortable that there's a good plan in place and that they've been heard and we've met you where you are um, and we, we've listened to your concerns and executed a satisfactory solution moving forward is our ultimate goal. So it's not gonna be your last bite at the apple. Um, uh, to, to all of you, thank you for your participation. It really guides our decisions. Um, we're not, we don't just say that, it helps us understand where the concerns are and gets us to a better product that you all can be proud of and feel good of when, uh, about when we're all done. So it, it takes the, the whole village in this instance. So thank you all for your participation.